Hi, Dave. Hi. Hey, Stephen. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you. Good evening. We're uh, already live, so uh, let's get right into it. Oh, yeah, first, remove the thumbnail. Okay, here we go. So, welcome to the live stream, everyone. Already a lot of viewers chatting away in the chat box. 35 viewers for the moment. And we already have a lot of questions. I also prepared a few questions beforehand, Dave. Two questions I saved up from my last live stream with Gil because they were about uh, pregnenolone and Gil uh, referred us to you. Okay. So the first question last time was, if progesterone is an optimal range, is that an indication that pregnenolone is not needed? If so, what are the optimal levels progesterone? Okay, that's a good question. So for a lot of people, they won't be able to get a pregnenolone in whatever country they live in. Um, outside of the US, yeah, and I believe Germany, um, it is quite difficult to get pregnenolone checked. So progesterone is it, it can act as a proxy for pregnenolone activity but it is far from a slam dunk um it's working with people on this if their progesterone is undetectable it is something where it will warrant further investigation either through ordering a test via maybe it's a bit more of a convoluted process to get that or potentially then alone, depending on what go, what's going on, the issue the that guys are going to have is that pregnenolone supplementation often, but not always. And this, this is why pregnenolone is so difficult to work with. It's a very unpredictable hormone. It will often increase progesterone quite significantly. If a guy already has robust progesterone levels and he takes pregnenolone and take his progesterone levels up to a point that it becomes super physiological for anti-antigenic. Unfortunately, progesterone in high levels will not only uh, act as an antigen receptor antagonist, binds to the antigen receptor and will compete with testosterone, DHT, etc. But it will also inhibit 5-alpha reductase. So this is why when you take pregnenolone and you don't need it, or you take too much pregnenolone, already have healthy progesterone levels, you will often get... Um, anti-androgenic symptoms and one of my favorite terms for this but it's a, it's a bit of funny term is, is gummy worm dick and for anyone who ex worm dick they will know exactly what that means you lose basically all so in terms of what are optimal progesterone levels in my opinion um anything that is detectable is fine um necessarily better and it's also what progesterone is something that we only need in small amounts in men da is very against progesterone supplementation in men and the more i have worked with God, the more i can see why that is in practice it may sound good on paper we pick the neurosteroid benefits or anti-stress benefits of progesterone and things that think it sounds like the the bee's knees but in practice, it's definitely not very well tolerated. So it, the, walking around with undetectable progesterone levels and, and they don't have any issues whatsoever. So as long as it is detectable, it is fine. Um, be really encouraging guys to do it. Having problems and you're having negative symptoms and your progesterone level is towards the, let's say the bottom end and you have in the reference ranges very very strongly very as well your progesterone from the bottom of the reference range to the top of the reference range is going to solve zero of your problems it may even make them worse in australia the reference range typically goes up 0.9 or a four um, um i say anything above a 0 0.5 is fine i believe in the states remember the actual unit off the top of my head um but i believe the reference range goes up to about 1.5 Again, anything above undetectable is fine. My experience for guys who are you know, maybe troubleshooting or working on this at home is if a guy naturally has high progesterone levels, let's say 
a higher progesterone level above the reference range. And then this is just my experience. These guys tend to be the guys who need a higher free testosterone level than the to get dialed in properly. The follow-up question on that was, is 40 nanograms per deciliter of pregnenolone low? So um, on, on my website, there is a masterclass called the Pregnenolone Masterclass. I go into this in quite a lot of detail. detail. Very good question in terms of what level is worth supplementing, supplementing and then what is a for with supplementation. Um, um, so... When I put this masterclass together, together, and if, if anyone's watching this, if you've got like a and you can't work or you've lost your job, just send me an email, Dave at Advanced Fundamental Health for free. Um, but it's a two-hour masterclass that goes into this in great detail. But thing below a 50 with symptoms and or, or a potential is worth a trial of supplementation. Below a 50, I would do a trial of supplementing if there's Low pregnenolone. And, and people can refer to my preg low pregnenolone symptom video on this channel, which is the second one I did. Um, and I describe in quite layman's terms and the things that kind of present clinically what would constitute low pregnenolone. If you have, um, um, if your levels are, let's say, for this gentleman, a 40 and you've got symptoms, I think 25 milligrams is a good starting dose. Um, undetectable levels. I would still be looking at starting at about 25 milligrams, but they're more likely going to need uh, 50 to get an optimal pregnenolone level. So yes, I would consider four. But the thing that I will caveat is there are plenty of guys with 35, 40, 50, zero symptoms, and they feel absolutely great. They do not need pregnenolone. But if there are negative symptoms and there is a potential root BI, or if DHA yeah, or cortisol, or, then yeah, I would definitely be looking at a trial for sure. Okay, Dave, thank you. Dave, in the chat box, I don't know if you can see the questions. No. Oh. Okay, don't, don't worry about that. But people are saying that your sound is, um, is, is not good. It's very bad connection. I asked, is it my uh, end or Dave's? It's, uh, it's your end. Uh, I hear you fine. I, I have no problem understanding you, but they say uh, to reconnect if possible. Mm, okay. Maybe I'll just kill the microphone and we'll just use the, the laptop uh, audio. It's, uh, yeah, strange thing because I hear you fine. Best runs in the came through sound really good, so I thought I'd done a really good job. No. Um, um, okay. What if I unplug the microphone? Can't hear me. I, I hear you now, yeah. Okay, yeah, cool. cool. Maybe that will be better because the microphone's off now. So we're just using the laptop audio. I don't know if it's the microphone or if it's your uh, connection. Could it be your connection as well? They were getting really good speed. So I thought that this was going to be really good. I was like, yeah, today. So. Yeah, but for me, it's perfect. I hear you fine. I see you fine. I have no problem understanding anything. But a lot of people in the chat box say, Dave's is a mess, they say. I don't know what is a mess. Okay, maybe we'll... Now they say great. Is it better? Yeah, must be. Okay. Okay, cool. let's go to uh, another question. I understand you fine, so I'm recording this anyway. So afterwards, I will be putting out the videos in separate pieces, each time a question and an answer. So I'll be recording it in a good quality. So I have um, three more questions prepared and then I'll go to the chat box. Next one. I use 35 milligrams uh, test E, test C blend every other day from a compound pharmacy for seven months now. There have been times where I have serious anxiety, feelings of swelling up, high blood pressure, heavy heartbeat, where it's hard to go to sleep even. And that will last for up to two days and comes on about eight hours after a shot. I noticed this more when I was using a slightly higher dose because of doing it every three days. I don't know what the hell is going on here, but I almost went to the hospital last time it happened. 
It's not regular anxiety. I can feel a surge of androgen feelings that peak out to a very uncomfortable feeling and aforementioned symptoms. He's 43 years old, five foot six, 176 pounds, work out three times a week, no caffeine, D3 10,000, NAC 1200, Tutka 600, vitamin C 1000. And uh, yeah, that's it. Okay. Firstly, I'll address the test test e, test e blend. That's like taking a Pepsi yep. and mixing them together. It's a complete waste of time, but it wouldn't be doing any harm. But mm -hmm. wondering about that, that is it's probably some kind of marketing or, or product that someone's you know patented from a lab to be able to uh, mark up. Look, in, in situations like this, I'm going to use this as an example to make a point. Issues like this are virtually impossible for myself to rectify on the internet because there are ones that need to be asked to be able to rectify this. Um, so being able to give someone personalized medical advice based on this much information is, I mean, it, it's basically putting a coin to see if I'm going to get the answer right. So the things to be looking into any kind of underlying medical conditions, a lot of the I find that if we're looking at secondary hypogonadism, which in, in my experience is guys I work with are secondary, the unresolved issue that caused the low testosterone in the first place is causing the side effects from the TRT. The analogy that I use, and I'm sure I sound like a broken before, but if, if your car needs a service up old Suzuki Swift and you put a Lamborghini engine in there, it's not. And what's going to happen is you're going to rip out of the car dealership or the mechanic yard with your, you know, shiny new engine. And then you're going to start to all the other issues that maybe you were getting away with before, but now you stress on because you're putting the gas down a lot harder with a more powerful engine. This is, I would say, would cause the vast majority of side effects that I see is the unresolved root cause that led to the low testosterone and guys are fighting against their natural biology because if you've got a biological state which is naturally suppressing your testosterone production and then you have to put more testosterone into the body it's not putting it into a situation that would be making those levels if it could so i would be looking at going okay well what led you to be in the first place that would be my first thing is underlying i guess we'd call it learned fear we'd call it anxiety um being more highly wired will cause this i mean this could this could basically be psychosomatic hearing that their issues are psychosomatic because it comes with the stigma of it being it's all in your something is all in your head it's still causing a very real biological cascade in the body so it's not it's not like to dismiss it all it can absolutely be psychosomatic in root cause. And that's not something that people should try to be running from. And that can be present. The other things I would be looking at is, I mean, the, the, the gentleman said that he described it as a overwhelming androgenic feeling. It's very, put a, a finger on what is what I mean, people will often, people can't differentiate adrenaline so maybe you can't can differentiate it. between androgens and adrenaline so that's also something to be looking at so i would be looking at potentially intolerances to carrier oils this is something that comes up i mean it comes up more often than i thought it would and that's worth looking into if you're having these weird side effects i mean he's only on i, I did a calculation on my phone he's on like 122.5 milligrams a week he could also be hyper responding so maybe his dose is just way too high for him some he needs 60, 70, 80 milligrams a week to get what the average guy or myself 150. So maybe he needs to get his levels checked. The other thing as well, efficiency. Um, that will also cause people to not be able to tolerate their TRT properly and get this overstimulated, cranked out. I mentioned in that second video on YouTube channel. So I would be looking into all those things. And if underlying anxiety and stress is something that in the past and you can go yeah i, I feel that um cbd phosphate video that made recently on this channel um that video is literally purpose made for someone dealing with it mm -hmm. yeah great answer thanks
How does Tell Me Sartan compare to Lo Sartan? I have no idea. Um, so I am not a... Um, I would be referring that question. He's the Tom Sartan expert. The reason why I like Thomas Sartan is it's got a long half-life. Um, I also like Thomas Sartan because it's quite forgiving with the dosing. I familiar no. with not to take someone hypotensive in terms of overdoing it. Um, but in terms of comparing the different Sartans together, that company, but I would be directing that to Victor Black. Okay. Last one that I've prepared. Um, can your body get desensitized or build up a tolerance to taking HCG? So the whole desensitizing of the Leydig cells thing, that was a realistic concern for a long time. What was desensitization of the Leydig cells in very high... And from memory, I can't remember if it was animal or human studies, but I have been looking at the long-term studies on HCG, particularly in men, because it's piped my interest recently. Um, one of the, the many male hormone replacement that irks me, because, and as far as I'm aware, no one else has either, is why do some guys react awfully to HCG and for other guys, it's the best thing in the world. Um, that's something I haven't been able to. I've looked at everything, everything from why, um, you know, for example, there's some studies that show that 10 IU of HCG every other day enough to produce a change in interest, intratesticular testosterone production. Five IU a day. Um, um, is the dose that we typically use, but it, it got them on the map. So I thought there may be hypersensitivity things. People, you know, and myself have done an experiment with Doses to see if the reason why we don't tolerate it is that we are too hypersensitive and we need to build a tolerance to it. But when we look at the longer term studies that they've done on HCG, they haven't found any kind of issues with desensitization. 250 units of HCG is the dose required to map testicular testosterone production. And typically, aren't really recommending doses beyond that per dose. Uh, much short-term fertility protocols i don't be concerned about doing the kind of optimal doses that we're talking about doing now we're still doing that 1500 iu once a week thing or you know if they're using like massive doses long term for people are doing that then could that lead to potential decent desensitization long term maybe but it hasn't come up in any of the studies even in those doses and just like doing TRT milligram per fortnight injection, you know, we don't really practice that anymore because we've kind of no if you're using HCG through a provider doing like the providers in this group who are using it in kind of you know the proper I don't think people have anything to be concerned about, no. Okay, that's clear. Okay, so let's get to the um chat box there because already a lot of questions have been asked um yeah i'll start with the first one but i don't think we will be able to handle everything so i'll give priority to uh, channel members that have a badge next to their name uh, since they're members of the youtube channel uh, um, as well people uh, using the super chat uh, option there um let me see first okay uh, does it make sense for me to have upper range testosterone, uh, 808 nanograms per deciliter, and estradiol, 52, while my DHEA is in the gutter, 53 micrograms per deciliter? I'm 39, not on TRT, and have a history of chronic fatigue. Also, low libido, erectile dysfunction, penile insensitivity, stress, and no muscle mass to speak of. I'm also deficient in vitamin D, and my bilirubin and ALT are slightly elevated. Okay, so I can't give personalized medical advice, but I can give you some things to look at. Anyone who's got elevation in uh, uh, needs to get a liver ultrasound unless they've previously had a liver ultrasound that has shown it to be benign. So if you have elevated Ruben and you don't you have, have any liver disease, you have something called Gilbert syndrome. Yeah, too, um, 
So that means that you don't. But in the event that you elevated liver enzymes as well, I would bet a conservative amount of money that there is would be getting a liver ultrasound firstly to check. If you have any liver disease, I recommend watching my liver masterclass on YouTube, which is a free video, which I think in the description of that, there's also a download, uh, which has a in there. Choline and Ocetol is a good treatment for that together. So I'll be looking at that first. Um, Deep go outside and get some sunlight. And if you can't do that, um, look at taking supplemental vitamin D. I've on this channel, Jeffrey Riddlebush just did a great video on vitamin D on this channel. Both of them echo a very similar thing around dosing. Um, so get your levels up for your vitamin D. That is going to help you in, in more ways than one. I would argue that not directly related. They could be indirect. How bad this goes, but again, I don't know. Um, but does it make sense for you to have low DHEA, like bottomed out and pretty damn good test? Absolutely. I think when it comes to this whole upstream, downstream hormone thing, people have taken this illustrative far too seriously. Um, there is a Pregnenolone, such cholesterol, pregnenolone, and then it goes across to progesterone and then down to the sex hormones. It's a diagram for explanation. Like a river that flows liquid down these. Um, and I think that that's been taken out of context a lot, and a bit of you know parroting bro science has happened in that in that field. We don't know how many pregnant to make a DHEA to make a testosterone, for example. So. And mix around pregnenolone steel, um, off. but DHEA, while it is a precursor for your body to make testosterone primarily in the testicles, primarily produced in the adrenal glands, not in the testicles. So I think of DHEA, if I have to slap a label on it for the sake of labeling things, um, adrenal hormone. So the things that you've mentioned are particularly the female insensitivity thing. The third time in this video, already, if you go and watch that symptoms of low DHEA and pregnenolone video, I specifically say like low penile sensitivity, but basically feeling like a lack of sensitivity, particularly in the glands of the penis. Um, that is a hallmark symptom of low DHEA. So yes, you have low DHEA and this is, this, this is why it's so important when guys are having symptoms of, you know, low testosterone that it's a panel because, you know, lo and behold, like your low DHEA is causing potentially that could be uh, caused by low testosterone. So it may not be as marketable or desirable from a marketing standpoint, but it sounds like it's what your body needs. It doesn't cause suppression. That loop. It's oral, like it's very easy to use. Um, I would really strongly recommend for, for you listening is, although if you're in the States, you can just buy DHEA at like Walmart, you can buy it on Amazon or whatever, still treat it like testosterone or thyroid. Practitioner who works with it, introduce a dose, blood tested, titrate up based on your blood work and symptoms. Don't just blindly those and get off the internet do it in a supervised fashion because although these look like vitamin supplements might come in the same bottle um they are very powerful hormones with very strong systemic effects but levels up ideally from the sun if that's not possible take a supplement clean that up um and then look at uh true efficiency awesome um, Dave, is there any evidence that TRT helps with migraines? Migraines, so I can comment on this. Um, evidence, no. Um, it's helped me immensely. Um, my migraines are, 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 are postural. Um, so so mine come from impingement in C5, C6. So they deal up with muscle, muscle wastage around the... But also strengthening up the... Um, the muscles that support the posterior chain to resolve a lot of the migraine issues. So depending on what actually, like if I 
pretty much what tension headaches but it depends on what the root cause of your migraines are if they're neurological or if they are like postural headaches so testosterone will have a lot of mechanisms of migraines. um it won't take them away because it's not going to or anything like that but testosterone of the effects of stress so it's going to help with the stress hormone cascade of being in pain potentially chronically if you get them a lot but it's also going to help support a body that is in pain a lot a chronic inflammation chronic inflammation has a lot of negative deleterious effects on the body and if we're looking at something like a migraine inflammatory excitotoxic experience um this is something that is going to impact the production synthesis as well as accelerate which is a three-pronged combination like shit. so testosterone is going to what someone who is in pain a lot and depending on the root cause of the pain help with with that but it depends on where it's coming from found that it helped me the most with my migraines um on the actual movement based things um are antioxidant supplements so we're looking at things going okay when we're in a migraine pain storm what is helps i try not to take painkillers personally um but the things that have helped well which again it won't take the migraine away but it helps but using something like i didn't prepare this before by the way it was just something like this just an antioxidant complex so this is like super antioxidant it's just a it's cheap it's effective um and what that's going to do is when your brain has elevated excitotoxicity from the potentially uh increased levels of glutamate again it's not take the migraine away but if you find that you can do maybe some exercises some, some antioxidants even things like injectable glutathione as well combination might be able to bring 20 30 40 percent that allows you to cope or manage with it to the point that you don't painkillers or you can get through the day thank you dave very well my doctor has prescribed me one milliliters every 10 days sustenance 250. in my country we are far away in trt methods I am thinking I am thinking to split the dose 0 0.33 milliliters every three and a half days. What are your thoughts? Yes, yeah, so in the UK, for example, it's sustenance on because it is so much cheaper. Like like ridiculously cheaper. Australia, there was a period from I think it was 2018 where for about 18 months. So we typically use primitive, which is an anti. Um that by the, the sounds of it someone forgot to order it in and then no one fixed it so we all ran out of an anthate for like a year and a half ridiculous so we all had to fall back on the only thing we had available so when we did that you know before i was a member of this channel before stuff was common knowledge so we were kind of still working out what to do with things so we all swapped from an anthate to sustenon and did protocols and no one had any issues whatsoever so what so you're prescribed 170 250 every 10 days so i would be looking at sustenance in the same way that you would be looking, looking at renanthe which is two to three the thing that i will caveat though is that a decent sustenance is both uh propionate and phenylpropionate which are fast acting esters so sustenon is something going to you will still get away with twice a week injections but you are going to get more of a spike immediately post injection um so Sustenone. often do better injecting more frequently than something like a nanthe is it needed no so plenty of guys do just fine doing a twice a week but if you notice a big vary day, of, day after injection versus day before injection i would looking at do i would look at doing you know three times a week every other day or even 
daily injections. And then what you can do is you can take that glass ampule of sustin on the jet and you can just transfer them into like a sterile vial and then you can just draw and inject them okay. um, or twice weekly with insulin syrup. Okay, thank you, Dave. Yeah, someone is asking about uh, high doses uh, testosterone, but that, that's not TRT there. NNT 400 uh, or CPNA 250 plus Sustanon 250. No, that's, uh, that's not a TRT related question there. Someone else says, I had the gel 200 milligrams a day. Maybe you mean the compounded cream, I don't know. The gel 200 milligrams a day. No, I got 100 milligrams a week of injection. I don't understand why such a lower dose of injection versus gel. So gel is awful. Gel, gel is, the, is the worst. You could, you could split hairs between gel, pellets, and the cats for like the worst uh, testosterone products. But gel's up there. So gel is, so we've got the over-the-counter kind of creams like Andrew Forte. Gel is even you use a scrotal application because it can burn the skin. So gel has very poor bioavailability in uh, the bloodstream from the skin. An over the counter cream and far, 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 far inferior to a compounded cream with enhanced absorption like liposomal or a treatise space. So, 200 milligram a day uh, protocol of cream. What you're on, right, Stephen? Yeah, but it's compounded to 20% cream. Yeah. But it will actually cross into the bloodstream and it will work great. The brands of gel yeah. won't get anywhere because it's not actually going to cross properly. So the issue, the other issue is that, I mean, gel is a very weak concentration. So the amount of gel that you would have to put on to get 200 milligrams a day, I mean, you bring your entire body with goo. Um, horrible. The risk of transference would also be very high because to put it on all over your body. So gel has very poor bioavailability and injectables are going to be far more bioavailable so if people are looking for a rough guide for like how much uh injections versus how much like good quality compounded cream this is translation because everyone's going to be different but when i start off swapping someone from one to the other if i look at your weekly dose of injections so let's say Grams a week of injections. I'll look at swapping you to start with 200 milligrams a day of cream, and that's how it goes. So obviously, it will need to be titrated. Some people respond better to cream than injections, but I find that's a pretty good starting finding an equivalent dose. So weekly dose of injections is a it's a daily dose of cream in terms of the milligrams of testosterone, but when we're looking at commercial preparations of creams and gel, I often have in it for it to work properly. Yeah. Daniel Bennett says, uh, can you talk about blood pressure issues with TRT? Yeah, absolutely. So blood pressure issues are a good symptom that there is either in terms of psychological stress or physiological stress. Um, there also can be, you know, build up a plaque in the up. arteries as well, but that would be a, you know, pre. When we're looking at, and again, I'm going to go back to the analogy I used at the start, is that if you take someone who is metabolically compromised, so let's say they're insulin resistant, high levels of body fat, or maybe they can, they've got high levels of psychological stress, like they're very, like, highly strong and anxiety prone. If you put a bunch of into their body and then not in a good healthy state to begin with you're basically as i said you're putting a very powerful engine in a car that can't handle it and you are okay. so the the best tip that i can see and this has been the the biggest commonality i've found maybe in the last year of, of working with guys is that if you're, you want to put the amount of testosterone 
be naturally producing if it could. So if you are an obese mid forties man who drinks a bunch of booze, you are not going to tolerate the level. It is just not going to work. What happened is your blood pressure is going to go up. So if you are dealing with high blood pressure, you are in one of these situations, using testosterone can be a good way to get you from where you where you want to be. But you have to make that commitment to go, okay, I'm going to use this intervention which is which is term, to go, okay, I'm going to take the testosterone that I want to be making that to allow myself to get to that point in an expedite. If you've got incredibly low testosterone levels and you're out of shape and you've got you know a small amount of muscle and a large amount of body fat, it's very difficult. Extremely, extremely difficult. So if you're going to okay, I've gone off track. I'm pretty far off track. I want to get on track, and I'm going to make that commitment. You can definitely journey, but you need to what I say meet the medicine halfway the testosterone to get you to where you want to be because injecting testosterone into yourself is not going to just turn you into the man that you want to become it's not going to do that it took me years to work that out when i started so high blood pressure my recommendation is to i also like to use things like ubiquinol uh ubiquinol um as well as things like mindfulness meditation cutting excessive caffeine down working on cardiovascular fitness, all of those things. Putting a pharmaceutical in. But if you do need the pharmaceutical to bring it hypertension in the interim, by all means, but don't rely on them. If you are using a physiological amount of testosterone, it shouldn't be causing you hypertension. If it is causing you hypertension, it's because testosterone into your body that it can handle at that point. And you need to go, okay, what do I need to do to be able to tolerate this medicine uh, in, in a healthful fashion? And usually for people with uh, and improving cardiovascular health. Mm. Yeah, sure thing. I had another um, broad general question. Can you share your knowledge and your view on androgen receptors? Their up and down regulation on TRT, is that a dose dependent thing? Yeah, good question. So I often explain to people with the, I guess we call them an old fashioned now, is that if the ball is flying around the pinball tape, it points until it hits the bumpers. So I visualize testosterone you can have a whole bunch of balls flying around the table, but they don't do you in numbers and doing things. Testosterone is not literally anything until it binds to an antigen receptor. So receptor availability is just as important as how much testosterone you have in the body. The problem is we can't do a blood test to go, what's your antigen receptor levels? But we can use things to kind of guess and determine when we, and this is one of the reasons why, you know, if you've been in the group or you've watched the other videos, you know, Justin, Jordan, Gil, everyone has been saying basically the same thing, which is your free or what level you need versus what level he needs versus what level I need is all going to be different. And one of the factors that's based on is your antigen receptor expression. Now, some of this is going in terms of stone, and some of it's also going to be epic. how your genes are expressing based on your current state of health what you're doing and what you've been doing for so things that are going to help with antigen receptor expression in my opinion uh, levels of fat soluble vitamins so vitamins a e d and k um as well as body fat percentage metabolic health I believe, I believe that those things are going to be what dictates how well testosterone treatment based on what I've observed. Vitamins A, E, D, and K, you can Google, you know, all of those 
yep, as well as estrogen receptor expression. And you can see that all of them have reasons around that. It's one of the reasons why you know, getting sunshine is great. Um, you know, getting your vitamin K up, whether it's via supplements or, or food. All of those things are really important. important. Eggs, superfood for testosterone. All these things, very rich in fat soluble nutrition. Um, these are going to be things that are going to impact how your androgen receptors express and also, lo and behold, how you subjectively respond to your T. Now, I don't, I've seen in the research, and I'm sure that I haven't read every single piece of research on this, but from what I've seen and from what other people have also echoed, is that in response to bioidentical testosterone in physiological doses, don't downregulate. A lot of receptors, like, like let's say, say certain types of dopamine receptors, actually upregulate, not downregulate. So while some dopamine receptors will downregulate, some will actually upregulate. Same with some serotonin receptors as well. And what the from what I've read is that the androgen receptors will up response to androgens, not downregulate. Now. Them with um, antigenic anabolic steroids, so um, hormonal analogs, or if you're using a physiological dose of testosterone, that may not be the case. But in the context, it seems that like they upregulate, not downregulate. It's one of the reasons why testosterone therapy improves in results as the months and years go on, not just weeks. So I think that's one of the reasons we get a um, long term improvement in symptoms is upregulation of androgen receptor expression. Mm -hmm. That's clear. MB, I am 33 years old and have low levels of uh, LH 0.1 and FSH 0.2, been on TRT for one year. Will starting HCG alongside help me become fertile again? Okay, this gives me... So, one, um, LH and F will 99.9% of the time be zero on TRT. If it's not, your testosterone is bunk or you're doing something wrong. Um, as I've seen, have had detectable LH and FSH and the ones and two, it should be zero on, on TRT because what happens is the text that you've got an abundance of testosterone present, this correct. And therefore, your body goes, okay, we don't need to make any more because then we would be overproducing hormones and we would be falling out of this homeostatic body regulates itself. In. So that's all good. Now, firstly, not everyone on TRT monotherapy becomes infertile. So, for example, I've been eight, eight years years. now, I don't use HCG. I am. I have no issue with fertility. My fertility results are great. Many guys are the same. As a contraceptive, we would have far less bodybuilders as fathers, and we would also be probably using it as a contraceptive. Um, you know, what do you call the bodybuilder if you thought DRT was a contraceptive? And the answer to that is so it doesn't give you a free pass, even using large doses of testosterone or, or so. Firstly, you may not be infertile. So, who is on TRT and they're worried about their fertility, first things before you start taking ancillaries, go get a fertility test and see where you're at because you may not even have a problem. If you do have a problem and you are infertile, then options. So, previously in Australia, and I can only speak from Australia because we're primarily practice, is we would use in higher doses because HCG will primarily receptor, but it will spill over into the FSH receptor in small amounts, enough to stimulate spermatogenesis. So the high doses of HCG aren't that by the large cohort of men. So what I prefer to do is Just look at, at, again, going back to how much testosterone do we need to fulfill the luteinizing hormone receptor in activating the testicle, maximum dose 
150 units a day. So I like to look at 100 to 250 units a day, depending on how well the individual tolerates it. And then I like to FSH, which is bioidentical FSH. So what this guy has got blood work, we are adding in the bioidentical FSH, just like we're adding in bioidentical testosterone. So I recommend a protocol of 50 to 150 units a week and then it's people are going well that's the the top amount is triple the big Discrep uh, discrepancy it's because it's the most people. so i have found that 50 iu three times a week effective does to produce not only a viable sperm sample but successful pregnancies um but some, some guys have needed a bit more it's just cost and it's not the cheapest medication so depending on with, you know, 100 to 200 IUs of HCG per day with 50, 50 IUs of FSH per week and then give weeks, produce a, a sperm test if you haven't had a successful pregnancy and then see where you're at. If you were infertile before or going on TRT, you are going to have much lower chances of being in a protocol like this because, you know, you might might have primary issues and making you infertile but if you were previously fertile this protocol works very very well um also you know you can use hmg instead of fs but i prefer fsh because it's bioidentical to men um and i couldn't just because i don't have any experience with it but what i would be recommending for for two thank you dave um what is the best way to manage high dht from transcrotal cream to protect my hair on my head i'm only mid-20s and don't want to lose my hair he says i really want to uh, to avoid uh, injections i've never been a fan of needles what about alternate application sites like biceps or forearms i think less dht is produced this way is that correct dave so in this situation my friend you're not going to be able to have your cake you're going to have to pick uh Pick some, pick some things here. So, if you're not a fan of injection, not wanting to lose your hair, I mean, it's like you're going to have to pick the lesser evil. So, firstly, if there was a, and this is this is my opinion, and I'm sure to agree with me, that's cool. Go listen to them. But I am not a fan of of any of the DA. Um, um, I do not currently think that there is a safe and effective hair loss. Um, if there was, I probably wouldn't be bought. Scalp micropigmentation. That's what I had done. Um, so I am not a fan of even topical dutasteride because I treat the guy from, from that. that. And I wouldn't wish that. So while that it may be Russian roulette and there may not be very many bullets in the barrel, if you get hit by one of those bullets, I can assure you it happens. And it is not worth, in my opinion, having that happen to you for the sake of your aesthetics in terms of keeping your hair there you can increase increase your physical attraction um with while still being bald i would i would like to think i mean you're talking to um when it comes to picking your protocol it would seem that the testosterone application will increase dht more than others where you apply it the issue if you're going to apply it step or in an elbow or like back of the knee wherever people are applying this you're going to get not just less dht but less testosterone in the body as well so you're going to get less of what you're trying to achieve and you may not be able to get the perfect you're looking for so if you are prone to male pattern baldness i.e you have the male pattern baldness genes it is going to be an uphill Hair. Now you may be, be able to use a combination of, let's say, asteroid, ketoconazole shampoo, shampoo, and maybe some topical minoxidil. Um, will absolutely work to keep it at bay. But then you're going to not only run into the side effects of potentially developing something like. Not only really doesn't happen, but you can read the the class action that was filed against the manufacturers, which they lost. Aware of the side effects in the clinical trials. Um, 
you're also going to be massively the most androgenic hormone in the body, which is DHT. And D and physiological and psychological benefits, which I talk about in my war and masculinity video. Now, topical dutasteride may reduce significantly less than you know oral finasteride or oral dutasteride, but you, you, you actually want to be increasing DHT as much as possible to be getting the benefits of it. So asking the wrong person on this. Um, and I'm sure there are other YouTube channels which will give you advice on how to, you know, use a combination of these treatments to keep your hair and give you the answer that you. But in this scenario, firstly, I don't. It's a fan of injections when they're not using needles regularly. I think it's apprehension towards stabbing yourself with a needle. I always tell guys, look, the first 10, 20, 30 injections are going to feel weird and psychologically uncomfortable because you have to overcome the mental barrier of your survival instinct saying, don't tell me no, this is good for you. Once you do it regularly, tiny little needle and it's a very small pinprick, it's not really something that acts as a deterrent. I find that if you start doing your injections, after 10 or 20 injections of like a 29 gauge insulin syringe, you go, chill i'm not really going to have an issue with this um you know applying the cream to other areas of the body and then trying to use something to also suppress your dht you're going to end up in circles and chasing your tail and probably not getting the benefits that you're looking for so i was devastated when i lost my hair um i was younger i had you know long hair that i used to you know dye shake around on stage and stuff i was very attached to my hair i was very up the barber and i said is it time and he looked at it and he said yeah it's time to get rid of 24 25 um but i basically on my shoulders and androgenized my facial features with testosterone and i think i suited pretty well i like to think so um and i think what happened this is just my personal opinion is that baldness and high testosterone levels tend to look better than baldness with i think the androgenized physical features baldness better if you think of like i don't know attractive male celebrities who are bald they are all men with muscular physiques and a high testosterone presence or physicality so I would be saying, well, if you haven't started TRT and you're worried you're going to look bad ball, find that you suit it a bit more once your body you know, androgenizes as a response to your treatment. I certainly agree, Dave. Um, yeah, we had a related question. Um, will test cream have the same effect as test injections on my elevated hematocrit? That's a good question. You would have to run the. Um, um, some people theorize cream causes less of a spike or increase in red blood cells than injections. Do. It's not something that I've ever observed, though. I haven't found it to be something I've observed. The thing that I've observed is high levels, as well as dehydration, is the biggest one, but higher body fat increased uh hematocrit to the point that it may be problematic uh compared to leaner individuals but people need to keep in mind that increasing red part of the benefit of, of testosterone it's part of the mechanism and if you've got slightly increased red blood cell levels over and you're fit and healthy that's not i think it's not the, the same thing as if it was in the context Let's say a diabetic obese individual. So increasing red blood cells is not so much a concern to be worrying about. It's more than baseline medical obesity that people should be worried about. And the increase in red blood cells is usually a symptom that goes along with, again, the analogy before, too much testosterone into a body that would pressing that level of testosterone. Yeah, that's clear. 
Um, we're almost in one hour, Dave, uh, before we, we round this up. Um, can you tell the people, if they want to work with you, how to contact you? Yeah, yeah so, so you can contact me via uh, advanced. Um, I also have a 29 Australian dollar ebook called TRT 101, uh, which, which is my instruction manual and template. How to dial in or troubleshoot your TRT. That's something which has helped a lot of individuals. You can also contact me via looking for consultations uh, or to check out my masterclass on Um Next, I'm going to be writing my follow up to that ebook called Beyond TRT. So I'm going to have a ebook on HCG, pregnenolone, DHEA, and thyroid uh, that people will be able to use in a similar fashion. But yes, if you'd like to reach me, uh, that's my website. I'm sure there'll be a link in the description as well. And contact me via there. Okay, thank you very much, Dave. Thank you, everyone that's still uh, watching the video till the end. Make sure to give it a thumbs up. I'm just checking the chat box if there was any question I've missed. Something not too complicated or uh, personal. How to find a good doctor. How to find a good doctor. If you're in the United States, it's very easy. You work with one of the amazing providers that are in the TRT and hormone optimization group. The, you, I mean, I'm assuming that this gentleman's in America. Absolutely spoiled for choice. I mean, in a lot of countries all over the world, there's not even a single competent provider. So, I mean, Elevate Clinic, at Restore, Jordan Grant, Jeffrey Ruderbush, um, having access to you guys is, is an absolute privilege because I mean, the way the moment where you can't even get testosterone prescribed. So, um, um, yeah, you guys have, have got some amazing practitioners there that you can work with. Yeah, come into the Facebook group with the same name as this channel. We have a lot of experts in there, as Dave is in there as well. We have a list of uh, clinics and uh, practitioners in the United States and some in Canada. Um, yeah, very, very difficult in some countries here in Europe to find anyone really. Like here in Belgium, it's just the same. Uh, most doctors are just clueless. You can't find one endocrinologist that is into TRT. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and, and you know, in Europe, if you're stuck and if you're not in a good financial I'd be happy to send people for free and you might be able to put together your own protocol. Yeah, thank you so much, Dave. Okay, let's round this up. Uh, we're at the one hour mark. Uh, I want to thank you again, uh, Dave, for doing this and for the viewers uh, watching and uh, posing all the interesting questions. So thank you so much. Talk to you next time. Thank you very much for having me once again.